Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio. Hola, hola. My name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish-speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Kids, do you like professional wrestling? Well, we like professional wrestling too. I am Jeff Hawkins. He is Chris Novembrino. Rest in peace, Richard Roundtree, the original Shaft, and Richard Mull Bull from Night Court passed away earlier today. Uh, for Chris's generation, the voice of Harvey Dent slash Two Face on Batman the Animated Series. Ah, nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have no uh, no banter today. What do you got? Um, I have a new song that I'm working on. You can, oh. you can hear that on the Instagram. What's it called? It's called Movies. Movies? Yes. It's a song called Movies. It's a song called Movies. <laughs> like, I don't know. I was trying to find a bit in there, and I couldn't get there quite. <laughs> Everything's a bit to me now, Chris. Just, uh, I know. I know. Uh, can, can we get a mustache update? Um, mustache is going well. You got uh, a little bit of a twirl going there on either got, end. Got a little bit, yeah. Like we're moving into like the sheiky baby sort of phase here. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and, <laughs> what was it you said last week? Do you, do you have any damsels you need me to tie on railroad tracks? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. <laughs> Damsels in Emu Time, Railroad Tracks, poems that you need written in iambic pentameter and or paintings done in a surrealist manner. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I will I will add um, oil fields you need. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Drainage. Yes. Uh, well, then let's just get to the news. Heck with it. Let's do it. WWE announced that the Royal Rumble on January 27th in St. Petersburg, Florida, at Tropicana Field, had the largest first day ticket sale in the history of the event. WWE also announced first ever pay-per-view PLE event from Germany, Bash in Berlin, that will take place on August 31st, 2024 at the Mercedes-Benz Arena. Fightful reporting negotiations for the 2024 backlash with the city of Paris, France, and 27 live events have been added to the existing 2024 schedule. WWE looking to conquer the world, Chris. And hey, you know, inflation is real. Except if you're Paul Krugman, according to uh, living expenses, transportation, food, and things that cost money. <laughs> but yeah, no, they had, they uh, they did an opening day ticket sales with all the expensive tickets going on sale and did gangbusters. Thoughts? WWE year despite kind of internal turmoils uh their ticket sales have been strong all across the world like all year this year um the berlin uh event is eight days after next year's wembley stadium event i mean so for the travel crew in europe 
That's a very interesting thing. Or if you want to travel from the States and just make a holiday of it, that'd be kind of interesting too. But um, you have to imagine big plans for Walter at the Berlin event. Oh God. Yes. He has to be going for the world title there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the big world title, not the Seth Rollins yeah. world title. No, 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 no. This, this has to be, if they don't use the Berlin event as a culmination of a big Walter storyline, I don't know what they're doing. I actually really like that they've now decided that PLEs can be worldwide as opposed to just states. I mean, sure, you had Crown Jewel, the entire, and that's you know that's coming up next week. Might be a special guest on the show to help us preview it. We'll see. But uh, you know they're going to be doing the stadium show. They're going to be doing Elimination Chamber in Australia next year. They are. <laughs> You hate to say this because it's so on the nose, but they've actually decided to become world wrestling entertainment this late into the thing. And really who this is going to hurt in many ways is AEW, I think. Um, yeah. I, because I, I, AEW, you know, had an eye on kind of expanding into Europe as well because, you know, that's where WWE had kind of been avoiding, to be honest with you. Right. And now that, and it feels like maybe a lot of that was coming from Vince. Uh, there was this, some sort of level of disinterest in really doing Europe stuff for whatever reason from his part, but especially with his departure, I would expect to see more of that. Well, if for him, if, well, number, and the other thing that, that's on the horizon too is possibly the relaunch of NXT Europe. He always had a weird relationship with like the UK though. Like, no, he does. Very... No, you're, you're correct on this. I'm going to expound on it. I, I think he always viewed Europe and foreign markets as lesser. And this was a American centric type product. Cause that's where the money was because every time they did a taping in, in, in the UK, it was garbage. Those shows that Vince put on, I mean, we, we'd come on here and talk about it. They, they, they taped three or four shows in the UK and they'd be these half-assed things, but they'd have this vociferous crowd who wanted, you know, an A show, pay-per-view level show, something with heat. And he'd just give them the most basic crap for, for those shows. And I, I, yeah, I, I, I see this as very much a Triple H thing. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I guess for me with like the UK, it always goes back to Shawn Michaels beating British Bulldog in the United Kingdom. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that far back 92 right or, or is it... uh no i think it was 95 okay was, what am i thinking right, of? it was 95 or 96 it was like right before oh i'm thinking of the uh, ultimate war i'm thinking of the ultimate warrior SummerSlam. that's what i was thinking of. go ahead sorry yeah yeah that was right before uh they had right before they started making dx like that was the beginning of the heart foundation DX. yes yeah, yeah. You're you're correct on that. Uh, AEW announced a new pay per view, World's End, December thirtieth, twenty twenty three, in Long Island, New York. All right, uh, December thirtieth is <laughs> is death for people who like sports because that's that's a Saturday. Uh, college football will be going. I think there'll be NFL games at this point going on. Long Island, New York, very interesting, of course, the home of one MJF. And uh, this is the fun part for me. If he's not signed, <laughs> it makes that show very, very interesting for the quote-unquote war of 2024. But I think he's signed. I, 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 I don't... I think I, he's signed, too. I, yeah. I, I, think, I, I think that's why that story has been kind of allowed to continue to bubble. But this will make, I think, eight pay-per-views this year for AEW. Maybe seven. I'm, I'm, I'm miscounting here. We had the big four. We had Wrestle Dream. We had Forbidden Door, and they'll be, yeah, this will be eight for them. Uh yeah. Try and build some. <laughs> Although what this really does is kind of undercut Final Battle as well for Ring of Honor. That's, I think that's just going to be on Honor Club for ten bucks. Um, but yeah, it looks like uh. Let's say those plans for AEW getting monthly pay-per-views, it's probably going to come to fruition. Yeah, I just think that this will be a pay-per-view in search of a product rather than the other way around. I am I'm agreeing with you there very much. Um, yeah, and uh, <laughs> I wonder if that's where they're going to do the big reveal about all this entire who's MJF the story. Who's the devil story 
yeah. uh, in the hometown. But we'll, we'll I, I am I have my fingers crossed that it's the Black Scorpion. <laughs> well, Ric Flair is in AEW Rick, now. It, it's Ric Flair. It's been Ric Flair all along, and it's gonna be it's gonna have Ole Anderson's voice, hopefully too. <laughs> The Black Scorpion and the Shockmaster. Oh my goodness! Uh, just... there, I don't think there was ever a more disappointing angle for my fandom than that Black Scorpion angle because the the way that it was presented was it really was people were thinking the Ultimate Warrior was going to be coming into uh, WCW to feud with Sting, his old tag team partner. And then even even as it went on, it's like, okay, Al Perez, kind of an interesting choice, you know, and then it's like the angel of death was a was a red herring, and then it just turns out to be Ric Flair. But up up but up uh fart. You know? <laughs> Watching it live, it was like you, you got the anticipation, and then the reveal was just like, Oh god, really? <laughs> Ric Flair really does make a terrible mystery reveal. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, it, uh, it's true, but that's been true for years, really. I'll, I'll, I, I added this because it's kind of interesting. Dana White talked about his relationship with Vince McMahon in a Sports Illustrated article saying that things were never good between them, but now they're great. My history with Vince isn't a good one. He tried to F me so many times for no reason whatsoever except just to F me. But that's in the past. Now that Vince and I are allies, no one's been a better partner than Vince. This is Dave Meltzer. White's quotes indicated that McMahon is now involved with helping the UFC business and is not strictly working on WWE business in his chairman of the board of directors position with TKO, where he's actually above White on the corporate depth chart. UFC has been left to run itself from the sports standpoint since the Endeavor purchase, but McMahon, like Ari Emanuel, who heads the big company, is involved in big picture deal making. He's not dead yet, Chris. <laughs> but he's Dana's problem now. Yeah, which is very interesting. I, oh, I just I want to see a board meeting where Dana and Vince are just going at it. And Ari's just rolling his eyes going, what have I got myself into? I, I mean, how long until he turns UFC into pride fighting? That's all, I, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> pride never die. Come on, Chris. I loved pride. All right. What you, got, what you guys need to do is you need to go three rounds, and then in the fourth round, really, really start laying into each other. Well, no, no, no. Pride was uh, first round ten minutes, second and third round five minutes, and then it wasn't based on a, uh, it wasn't based on a round scoring system. It was based on who you thought won the fight and who did the most damage at the end. But it's kind of interesting you, you drop the pride comment because it, it, it's very much like the WWE versus AEW arguments because pride fans hated when UFC bought pride. You know, it, it was the, they wanted their purity. They wanted, you know, boxing ropes and, <laughs> and yellow cards and, and other things like that in their fight because in, in pride also you would get warned if you weren't being aggressive enough. Um, to try and finish it. So, so that, that's an interesting poll there, but uh, yeah, I could, <laughs> if Vince pitched pride to Dana, <laughs> who owns pride now, but uh, I, I, I teased this before we went on air. The, the two bad ideas happened this week. The biggest one announced at impact wrestling's pay-per-view 2024. They will be rebranding as, TNA wrestling. <laughs> so you build up a wrestling company based on uh, one part of TNA or of Impact Wrestling's legacy will always be the Knockouts division, a strong, strong women's division for which other companies were seen as being lacking, and then you decide to go to this stupid, sexist name that Vince Russo came up with. <laughs> Because you think that there's some sort of nostalgia value in the TNA brand. I, no. I mean, the original <laughs> name was a bad idea to go back to the original name after finally getting away from the original name. I, I mean, I've been doing this so long that back when I first started doing stuff for Voices of Wrestling, I was doing TNA stipulation. That's right. And 
one of the things like people ask me like how could they be a better company and i literally suggested changing the name to impact wrestling so so, I, so you came up with impact wrestling no no i just i mean <laughs> they, they just, like i mean they already had tna impact it was like it was right there it's just right that's obviously a better name for the show yes yeah, and they finally did it way too late like three years too late and now them to get cold feet on this and go back to tna a name that literally no one wants them to go back to i've I've not heard i have never heard a person say to me they should really go back to tna not one scott demore <laughs> i mean i just in in, in all the chats and stuff like I've just never once heard someone say, you know what would help turn the corner for this company? Going back to TNA, the name. Yeah. No one says that. That's just not a take that anyone has. Speaking of somewhat bad ideas, Ric Flair debuted as Sting's surprise gift from Tony Khan on the October 25th Dynamite show. Flair has no contractual ties with WWE. He probably would have come in earlier as they were in talks when the Dark Side of the Ring episode about the plane ride from hell hit and pretty much all talks ended. But Tony Khan wanted him to be part of the Sting storyline and he's supposed to be on the show as part of this through March. Dave also believes that part of this also will help promote his woo energy drink. I guess energy drinks are the new NFTs or at least that is what is being talked about. I love me with some Ric Flair. Ric Flair's on my in, in my top five wrestlers. He's probably number three after Tully and Arn. I just don't find him that useful as an on-screen presence any longer. And I get the feeling that now that he's quote-unquote signed and along for the ride, we might be using him with his son-in-law, one Andrade El Idolo as well, because that was possibly the thing, but I don't, I don't know, Chris. I, I mean, there were, I saw a lot of brilliant ideas for this surprise from Tony Khan and for it to be Ric Flair, who's probably just going to screw him at some point for some lame angle, but. Oh, cause he's the black scorpion, <laughs> but it's so funny listening to, to the cries of the people who are, who are more um, wanting AEW to be uh how how do I put this? A more sensitive company in some ways, I guess, is how I put it. And I, I remind them, you you remember that Tony Khan brought in Mike Tyson at one point to possibly be a star? Yeah, sure, he did his time. It's not like Flair, but I mean. Uh, no, no, you know what? Uh, compared to Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, I will totally go to bat for Tyson. Oh, will you? Okay, I will, I will in the argue sense over that. that. He, no, in the sense that he's legitimately repentant. Has like, he? he? He's. He, I he, have he, never heard him be contrite over the things he went to prison for. I've heard him say, okay. "Yes, I went to prison," but I've never heard him apologize for any of that. I, but I, I understand mean, your point. Like he's actually expressed regret for his old way of living, whereas like Hogan never has in any no. way or neither has Ric Flair. No, and and I, I like, look like, I and I'm not I'm not trying to apples to apples even. Yes, this, but I will I will certainly say Tyson. Um, at least has expressed something more resembling remorse than uh, the other two have. Right. And, and, and Hogan Hogan's issues were broadcast far and wide by various different media outlets, et cetera, who, you know, the tape, the sex tape and the N word tape and all that other stuff. Ric Flair's dalliances as a drunken lech slash possible accusations of uh or not possible accusations but accusations yeah, yeah, of possibly being a sexual assault. assault yeah those aren't as widely known to lapsed fans people who aren't in the bubble i mean people know that he's you know he used to party and he used to womanize but i mean i mean it, when, when when people get angry that he gets a pop at a show I mean, what percentage of people do you think know about those things at the same time? I I, I get it. I mean, I I wouldn't use Ric Flair. I just I, I'd oh, use him for, I, as a regular thing. I'd use him maybe once, but this isn't the way I'd use him. And I said it last week, and I'll stand by it again this week, a week later. Now that he's on TV, if you're booing Hulk Hogan, you should be booing Ric Flair. 
Like the same people who were booing Hulk Hogan's name mentioned in Sting's promo last week should have been booing Ric Flair's name being mentioned last week as well. Um, instead, they, you know, were lukewarm to positive on him, and they shouldn't be, in my opinion. I, I agree. Um, yeah, Rick Rick Flair is one of those guys. I can watch his wrestling, but I don't want to watch him now. He's just sad, oh, and he's no. looking and he's looking for alimony for the most part, and it's just oh, wrong though, too. I mean, beyond beyond everything else, like okay, so the allegations and all of that, uh, he has not been entertaining. Yes, in a wrestling component in in a tremendously long time at this point, at least five six years. He's he he wasn't entertaining in any of the Charlotte stuff. Um, oh God, no! He was terrible in the Charlotte stuff. Yeah, he, the, yeah. the last match stuff, he was kind of entertained, but the last match itself stunk on ice, except for Jared and Lethal in there, and yeah. Andrade. I mean, he he did nothing in there because he was <laughs> taking out his defibrillator or whatever. But I mean, it, yeah, it's it's like he's there to bask in the glory of who he was and to enjoy the spotlight every so often. But it's just like, in terms of actual usageness there there isn't much there really and i just i mean even if he's part of this angle i just don't see it really right and let, I, and let the the one thing my one joke was we bring tully back and we get arn tully and flair beating down sting and then just take lying down and taking a nap <laughs> it's like, that's no, it the retirement angle is that they finally let sting join like on on the day of his retirement, they finally all come out and finally let Sting join the Horsemen. Yes, and then Oli comes out and says, "No, I'm not having this." <laughs> <laughs> this is the most we've ever talked about Oli Anderson on this show, but <laughs> he's such an old crank; <laughs> he'd never come back for it. Uh, no, um, I I don't see any utility in him at this point, but I don't. I mean. Allow me to read this paragraph to you, though. That and, I, you know, no, but here's the thing: like, okay. like real quickly, real quickly on this, it it speaks to like this recurring con tendency towards I'm going to pay contract for guy, uh, I'm going to get guy, and then we're all sitting here going like, yeah, what's the plan with this guy? Like, what? Yes. Like, why? Why this? Cause, like, I don't need it to be completely obvious, you know. You know, to the song before it gets played, but like, uh. I mean, I can't even see Ric Flair at this point. I mean, I get that he's Ric Flair, but why would you sign Ric Flair to a contract of any length? Like, what? Well, well, allow yeah. me this paragraph then, because this is fascinating, and I had forgotten all about this, even though I had realized this was happening at the time. This is Dave. There's a problem at this point with so many older wrestlers. It's not even that they are bad, and Christian has been great, but you had Billy Gunn, Rob Van Dam. Sting, Flair, Adam Copeland, Christian, Chris Jericho, and the Hardys all on the same show, one after the other. This is a retirement home for wrestlers picking up yes. pensions, yes. pretty much. This is turned into TNA. Yes. It, it has turned into what TNA was at like some of their lowest points when they had stopped trying to actually build their own talent. And instead started to crutch, and like, I'll be honest, like, bringing in Rob, it's a cheap pop is what you're doing with Rob Van Dam. Christian's amazing. Like, like, I got no knock on Christian at all. Christian's amazing. He's still got plenty of tread left on the tires. All those other names you mentioned, though, up to and including Adam Copeland, I'm kind of like, um, there Billy, are two, there are two legends doing, or three, maybe I'll, I'll count Billy Gunn in there. I'll Billy count Gunn. Billy Gunn. Billy's been pretty solid. Billy and he, and you know he gets pops even though he, he's such a freaking giant <laughs> compared to everybody else in that ring. Uh Christian Cage and Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, Jeff Jarrett's been doing perfect stuff for Jeff Jarrett level. Yeah. It, because his his value to this company is everybody's scared to death they're actually going to belt him. <laughs> That's his story. The story is he gets because he's had he, there was some statistic I want he he's had like twenty five matches this year, singles matches and eleven of them have been title matches, but it's also like that that Kingston thing we'll get to in the Lazy River is my one of my favorite feuds right now is between that Jarrett crew and Eddie Kingston because they're just cutting promos on each other and they're great. Jarrett's really entertaining and I also don't consider him to be in the same categories as those those other guys just in the sense of he's not. 
he's not a nostalgia act because no one was ever fond of him in his day. <laughs> <Well. laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's actually true. I got. I know. Because I wasn't fond of him really no. until this run, and then this right. run, I'm, I'm just like he's my I, favorite wrestler. I don't sit here and hum the old like WWF theme. Like no, I don't sit around and like hum the old Jarrett. Uh, but he he's really entertaining. Christian, I mean, yeah, like Christian is. I mean, he's not being he's not being the Christian of 2004, but he's definitely being a familiar version of Christian. Uh, Copeland, obviously, nostalgia act. The Hardy Boys reek of nostalgia. Oh, good lord! Rob, just... I mean, this, it's all they trade in. It's their it's their chief export. Um, same thing with Rob Van Dam. Um, you know, he's looking okay right now, but like, he, I mean, he's you know, he's also fine. He's perfectly Rob Van Dam like. Uh, it, it, perfectly cromulent Rob Van Dam matches. Um, <laughs> That's what I want. The whole cromulent show, Rob Van Dam. The whole cromulent show. Uh, I, I and then was the other. Oh, Jericho. I guess your mileage may vary with Jericho. It's like sometimes I feel like we get a good match out of him, and sometimes we get like lots of stinkers. And I hate all of his storylines. And I think once you start, I mean, you start adding all these things together. You know, Sting. Sting's really entertaining. I actually I don't have a problem with Sting's presence at all in the company. I think he's he's always been Sting's used perfectly. Yeah, he's used per it's kinda like Jared. Like the, he's used perfectly. Um That Sting is his role. His role is to be legend who occasionally no sells and then yeah, and, yeah. And, and and gets a roar. My my issue with Jericho is you watch a Jericho feud and you know, okay, it's against one of the young guys, he's doing his thing. Jericho loses. Okay, that was a pretty good program. And then Jericho's in yet another program and is elevated against another young guy. And you're like, wait, hold on here. <laughs> I can't miss you if you never leave type and of And the thing. young guys aren't ending up better off after right. having worked with him, um, which is which is the other kind of problem here. It's like, he's like, there, like, I'm here to help you, kid. And then, like, he doesn't. And, like, the, the kids are never better off after working with him. They don't read some numbers now, ratings wise, because uh, it's interesting. AEW Dynamite on October 25th did its lowest viewership for a show in its normal time slot since June 15th, 2022, and its lowest 18 to 49 number since June 28th, and second lowest of the year. NXT on Halloween have, and they had limited competition because they were on Wednesday, which was the second night of the NBA, etc. First week of NXT Halloween Havoc on 1024 did great numbers considering the co competition because there were two, I think, two baseball games and uh, and the opening of the NBA or one baseball game. I think it was just that like game seven. Show did 787,000 viewers and a .21 in 18 to 49. Number likely due to Becky Lynch, of course, being on there. Uh, Raw? Uh, no, Raw was the one that had two baseball games on that night and Monday Night Football. Uh, one and a half million. Almost eighteen to thirty four, six hundred two thousand, and a and a point three eight, and eighteen to thirty four. Collision did five hundred eighteen thousand, which wasn't too bad, a point one six. Although uh, Battle of the Belts only did three hundred ninety seven thousand, because people thought that was a worthless show. SmackDown without Roman Reigns and Triple H, but with John Cena and Logan Paul, did two point two five three million viewers, point five nine. Top show on network television behind baseball. And yet Fox decided we don't want this product on our, sh on our network. Um, I want to say that the AEW chatter is a bit overwrought, but it's lower. And that needs to be, that needs to be commented on. And my question to you is, is it the old guys? Is it the change in style to more? I wouldn't say, I'd say character based stuff. Is it just that there's too much wrestling on television and we've decided now to kind of manage our time and WWE's the hot hand? Is it MJF at the top versus somebody else? Uh, what's your explanation? You're not in the bubble. AEW's inconsistent. Yes. That's a good that's a good answer, I think. Yeah, they're they're just they're just wildly inconsistent. I um, find it heatless. I think that's my problem with it is that they're you know the feuds are 
whimsical in a way. They're not really serious feuds. And then the, yes, there's there's this other element of like weird cheekiness, like the Max Caster MJF stuff, um, the Adam Cole Roddy Strong stuff. I I don't. I get that like there's room for comedy in wrestling, but it one the thing about comedy is it needs to be funny. Yes. And that's a big problem with some of the W attempts at comedy is they fall short of actually being funny. Like the Roddy Strong, Adam Cole thing that we had to watch twice that one week. The only funny thing about that is that they've made us watch it twice and it was actually worse the second time with sound. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> I mean, that was funny though, but not for the right reasons. Yes. <laughs> but... Yeah, I, I don't know that I blame MJF per se. I do. The old guys, I think, are more of an issue. And this, they are, by their definition, the land of diminishing returns. All of these dudes have a retirement date. Oh, guys, stop texting me at this time. <laughs> You're going. All my, these guys, it's my mother. <laughs> they all have some sort of. Uh, you know, limited time window. You're not getting more out of them the more they wrestle. You're getting less out of them every time they wrestle. And I think, more importantly, the time spent of those guys, right? Like Rob Van Dam and the Hardys, they tend to be pretty... Jeff Jarrett matches sometimes get a little more length, but a lot of times Jeff's like just a preliminary act. Yes. But the one that really sticks out to me out of that whole one that you listed off is Jericho, who has often had... 15 20 minute segments on aew television and could that not be better given to another younger talent is this you know like wouldn't we be better off having 20 minutes of i don't know like adam well that sort of thing well, that'll do it for news um going to the lazy river of wrestling criticism whatever we watched where we had time for Whatever's on our mind in terms of the world of wrestling, we'll cover it here. Uh, I'm going to start with a uh, mini, uh, you know what grinds my gears? Headlocks? <laughs> I actually like a well-done headlock if it's actually doing, you know, if it's not a rest hold. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine with me. No, uh, but it's, it's in the s similar vein. I am so done with unnecessary overruns. And unnecessary calling something a dream match and then just throwing it on TV with no build whatsoever. I, I the overruns are the big one for me. I, I, I don't mind an overrun here and there, especially if it's a hot angle or a hot, you know, afterwards or whatever. But both AEW and WWE are abusing my time at this point by dragging out already long shows to make them even longer when it's not necessary. The one time this week I thought it might be justified was on NXT for the Lyra Valkyria versus Becky Lynch women's title match because it was such a big moment for that. But you both have two or three hours of television real estate every night. Let's fit it in <laughs> to the applicable time slots, please. Uh, are you done with it or no? Are you good? I, I don't like the I don't like the overhangs. Uh, the one that bothers me more is the dream match one though, because to me a dream match necessitates both parties involved in that dream match working hard, like at least at four star level. And a lot of times recently, like a dream match has been kind of bandied about, and then you get like television work level three and a half stars yeah, special. And that's not a dream match like chris wouldn't it be great to see bret hart go up against the the great muda and they mostly just do chin locks <laughs> like yeah oh yeah no sign me up for that i want to see that <laughs> yeah and tony's the one throwing around those words a lot it's like every week is a brian danielson dream match and look i i loved that andrade match on saturday on collision it was great but if it's a dream match i want you to hype it more than two days also you know get some try 
try and do the things that pro wrestling used to do well in terms of getting that shouldn't be on your b show i'm sorry a dream match should be on dynamite as the hallmark of dynamite okay then then in that vein i got i'm gonna take up a little bit more of a time on on the show and, and ask you this mjf versus kenny omega on saturday night with three days build it's like they just realized that they should be doing this (laughs) <laughs> that, like that he should be the road no I, I i i this 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 feels like the continuity guy came in there was like well i know we're doing this thing with kenny omega like shouldn't he be the roadblock to him beating the streak and like and the answer is yes but that actually should have been the thing frankly you were building to for a minute here yeah uh, leading into this like like Kenny Omega. You should have been hyping this for a week. It's only so many days until MJF breaks Kenny Omega's streak as the longest reigning AEW world champion in its short four-year history. And Omega for his part where he beats Joe uh, for number one contendership. Like basically Omega, Omega's on a quest to stop MJF from getting his belt. He does certain things to heat himself up to make it look like he might actually be a credible contender to MJF's belt. And instead that we've been given, I think we would, we're either going to get one of two things, one, uh, three and a half star match at best or two, an angle, a skitlet. Oh, we're getting, no, we're getting a, we're getting a screw job finish in this match to then lead to, in my opinion, I think I think this is where this is going, and we talked about this on my other show. So I'm, I'm this isn't an original thing from me. There, uh, Bullet Club Gold's going to ruin this match, and then we're going to get to uh, MJF teaming with all the people coming after him to keep his enemies closer. Because we just saw the thing with with Joe yep. being his partner. Omega will then join, and then MJF. Or not MJF, uh Wardlow will be this and it'll be it'll be an eight man tag match featuring MJF and all his enemies versus Bullet Club Gold. That's what I think we're going with this. Mm. And at some point we're gonna get the tremendous reveal of who the devil is. Which is uh, they're gonna, gonna be Adam that. Cole or Britt Baker, I think. I they've think been, <laughs> they've been teasing that more and more on TV. Although I'd be here for it being punk, but that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Oh, that'd be great. That'd uh, be great. Uh, your first take on the uh, Lazy River here, Chris. Man. Um, okay, it's it's not a long match. It's not even like the most noble match on the show or anything. But I will tell you, when I saw that Lola Vice for mid mat or like mid tournament match that was you know going to be kind of like her showcase match, I was intrigued because they. They have something with Lola Vice. She's very over with the fans. Uh, she she has she has a thing. Um, this match was, I was not expecting it to be like a you know a classic match. Uh, who's the who's up against? You you just you just went out a bit on me there. What what? Uh, what was the, the name of the person she was up against? Uh, Carmen, Carmen Petrovic. Yeah, I was Petrovic, like yeah. yeah, Carmen Petrovic. Yeah, um, they've really done very little with Carmen Petrovic. Um. And so I wasn't expecting this to be like super well worked or whatever, but I was hoping it was going to be an interesting character showcase for Lola Vice, like that we were, you know, kind of you know, establish a little bit more of like what is she about in the ring or whatever. And this match was, I thought, just an absolutely terrible vehicle for Lola Vice and also Carmen Petrovic. Like they effectively have it's like baby face versus tweener but like the tweener's working essentially as a face and but but everyone likes and knows lola vice so no one's cheering for carmen petrovic she's having this unbelievably hard time doing it and then the match is divvied into like a 90 10 wherein petrovic gets a ton of offense some of her kicks look pretty good i i, I will certainly grant that it was baffling because like you know lola vice eventually just hits like a spinning hook kick um that's lights out for petrovic and that's like that should have been the match to me because lola vice is the heel here in the tournament with 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 the with the uh team up with carmen uh or electra lopez electra lopez not carmen san diego electra lopez she used to dress like carmen san diego that is true she did she did do it (laughs) but we're, we're building this up for her to be 
the heavy against Kalani Jordan. That's the name, right? Or is it Danny? Yeah, Bryan? yeah. I mean, yes, but all this I... need to be was was the was the Malachi Black spin kick blackout one two three. That's all this needed to be because Carmen Petrovich can be built up later. Right, and you're just a st- and like a fluke knockout like this is not fatal for a new young talent like a Petrovic or whatever. Right, it would do a lot for Lola Vice. Um, and, and to your point, commentary didn't even didn't even really put over the surprising knockout power of Lola Vice and her ability to like. It was very weird because like at the end of the match, you you'd be forgiven for coming away with the impression that Lola Vice was the baby face here because if she was getting beat up on for most of the match has a plucky uh, come from behind victory against an opponent who was, you know, getting the better of her. And she wins with like a really well-placed knockout blow. That's like classic baby face underdoggy sort of stuff. Yeah. And since we're in the same neighborhood, we went over this for the show, but I'm going to mention it again. Oh, Pillman Jr. Lexus King's debut against Dante Chen, which was a 90-10 affair in favor of Chen, who has no value to this company whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, and, yeah. and, and let's suppose he did. This would not be the time to try to, like, make the kid shine. Like, like this is the debut here. This is a guy that you gave vignettes to for three weeks. And you're bringing him in as a big deal, and you have him struggle against Dante Chen. In, like, the most jobbery, jobberist tights in the world. He was wearing, like, sprinkle tights. Yeah, and, the, and, then, and, then, he, and then he ekes one out. Congratulations, Lexus King. Big yeah, what is his next match? Right, yeah, no, big, bigger and better things. Yes, yeah, so the whole point of this. What is next for this young up and comer? The whole point of this being fake is that so you can make people look good, so that they want to come back and see him again. Who the hell wants to see him again after struggling against Dante Chen? What are we doing? And that that company knows better. That's the thing that kills me. So it's like one of those things where it almost feels like, well, we're giving you the kid. Eh, do something. And then it's almost like he was a Vince signee. And then Vince leaves and then they just decide, well, we got to put him on TV now. Let's make him look as bad as possible. Yeah. All right. I, I, I hinted at this before. I'm going to say it's my favorite feud in wrestling right now is Eddie Kingston versus the Triple J stable. I love this feud. I adore this feud because it's basic professional wrestling. Guy cuts promo saying he doesn't like someone. Guy cuts promo elsewhere right back saying he doesn't like the other guy. Guy wants title shot. So friend decides to challenge other champion to a match and they talk trash. Eddie Kingston doesn't like Jeff Jarrett because he thinks he's an old carny, which Jeff Jarrett is, and he has problems with Jay Lethal hanging around the guy and has other issues stemming from times in other companies with Jay Lethal. I'm good with this. We do a Memphis street fight. Wacky, wacky, wacky. I loved every minute of this, but it gets the job done where Eddie Kingston, who has literally burned his bridges with every friend he's had in this company, which is why nobody's coming out to help him, which is a great little piece of continuity, but he fights against this entire group of misfit toys, loses to Jeff Jarrett as he should. And then because of the stipulation, now he ha- now Jay lethal has a title match against Eddie Kingston and we can escalate from there. I love this feud. I love Eddie Kingston. Jay lethal is a sneaky good promo in these four ways on it's mostly on social media, but I think they're going to play it on rampage tonight. Jeff Jarrett is of course, you know, legend with a lot of heat and everybody's scared to death. He's going to get a title, but he does his job. And uh, you know, the one thing in here is I I really want them to be building up Satnam a lot more. Like I love Sanjay being a weasel. Karen, Karen's going to be Karen, but Sanjay or not Sanjay, but Satnam Singh would kill for half the exposure that Omos got on WWE television. And he's better than Omos. He's three times better than Omos. 
No, he's Omas, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh here you go, know. sir. Um uh see <laughs> like god like rv th this hook in rvd versus john silver and alex reynolds match i think like is kind of emblematic of the problem here like i i get bringing out rvd for the philly pop or whatever but match you know he he was a ricky morton of this match he was working 90 percent of this match when he should be the hot tag at the five star score frog splash and get out of there yeah i know but the, like that that's the kind of the problem with hook as a tag partner though is that like it's yeah. not if you beat up on hook too much people start to realize that he is actually pretty small like the thing is that like he's you know like mighty mouse but like the, he carries himself in such a way where he doesn't come off as small as he actually is yeah but if you start like laying into him and make him have to take too much heat, you do sort of start to take away from the mystique of Hook. It's it's a weird dynamic. He has like he has weird shortcomings as a uh, as a partner. Um, I'll give you another one. Go ahead if you got. Uh, I don't, man. Uh, God. Uh, like I I don't know that I, I'm just having into Sheeta as a champion again on AEW. Um, like well, Pete, her, you, you spiked a bit there. Give me. Another I'm one. having a very hard time getting into Sheeta as a champion in AEW. Okay. I feel like we've been there, done that, and like she has like good matches, but her matches also just like don't. Her matches are good, but she's never built. Uh, she's never has an opponent built for her. They're always just people kind of thrown there after like a week. Like Ruby, right. Ruby. No, no offense to Ruby. I like Ruby. She's just there, though. She's just there. You know, yeah. Willow, Willow's yeah, there. Yeah. Sky Blue's there. Julia Hart's there. Britt even is there, although she's been off for a while. Nobody, you know, Emmy Sakura, at least they did the the video package of her as, uh, you know, you know the history of those two, and she was her trainer, et cetera, and it gave some backstory to it. But we're not, built, we're not, and, and, you know, in the early days that's, of AEW. That's my big knock is that, like, Sheeta is a terrible vehicle for telling stories with, or they have done a terrible job telling stories They've with They've done Sheeta. a terrible job with it because the one story they <laughs> did tell that was pretty good was the Nyla Rose Sheeta story, but that was two years ago. They haven't done anything since. And, I mean, it's funny because I'm about to get, go on my lazy river about the women's stuff in wwe being very good because we're i mean yeah we're doing random title matches here and there but i mean for, becky had herself a week we had matches with tegan on uh, i believe smackdown we had the we had the indy hartwell match was better than it had any right to be on raw and then we had a pretty damn good lira valkyria becky uh match where we crown a new star we had a story about you know her looking up to Becky as a fellow Irish person. You know, we, we've played through all that. They had a hell of a match, and Becky left that NXT women's title better than she found it. Oh, yeah. No, no, she, she was a very successful title run for, for like, a WWE performer coming down to NXT to do a stint in NXT. I, I think this might be the best one ever. Yes, and and that was the entire job, and you know, it, then it also gives her a little bit of completion in terms of uh, hitting for the cycle for all belt she can hold because she had she didn't hold that when she was still in NXT. But I mean, every single person she had a match with, even ones who have been languishing on the roster for some time, like Indy Hartwell on the main roster, Tegan Knox, who was you know who was brought back for this. I mean, I they like were made the better for it. I liked the little mini build to Indy Hartwell and uh, Indy Hartwell and Becky squaring off on Monday. They, yeah. Like, yeah, th that like the stuff with her and Candice and like, it, I mean, if you know the story, you can see this, like there was enough of a story there that you could put together the story a little it, I mean, it's a little bit head cannon or whatever, but like you're still able to still able to put it all together. Um, and, and just to get all the women, all my women's wrestling points out of the way. I thought that Kiana James Roxanne Perez match over delivered. I think Kiana James might be the most improved wrestler 
uh, in at least the WWE this She's year. Pretty good. I, 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 I had this, I had a moment watching her this week where I was like, darn she's actually pretty good you know who else is pretty good who i have to just eat crow on because like this week he showed up and did start doing all these moves i've literally never seen him do ever um but they look good duke friggin hudson yes god duke Duke hudson has a has a great uh, i i told you this last i watched all this stuff and i'm like oh crap i have to go on there and eat crow on this because he's looking great he's such a dull personality but in the ring he has a lot of charisma in terms of his baby face fire. And it's amazing at times. I'll his move execution. His move execution just looks good. Like, like they're very, they're crisp. His, his moves look solid. I, and, I'm, I, and, and, and yes, Chase, you needed to have a tag title run. Although uh, Chekhov's but, towel is still looming with, with Thea Hale ready to throw that towel to get back. At, at her not winning the title herself. And uh, and look, I, <laughs> I've said this before, just watching the facial expressions and how she kind of throws herself into it, I love me some J.C. Jane. I think she... Oh, J.C. Jane's great. That, that's what I was going to say. Is like the J.C. Jane as like the bad cheerleader or whatever. Yeah, she, she she's so she's funny. doing the... Uh, oh, what's her name? Um, uh and 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 bring it on the uh oh, she, oh i know her name and i used to have a crush on her i can't remember her. she was also on buffy i think at one time the the you know she always plays the bad girl type of thing in in, in the in the preppy thing but that's such a great story to tell and she's the bad girl but she's also like affecting everybody like i'm waiting for she's gonna date one of these two dudes right yeah she's gonna have she's gonna have a crush on mr chase oh there we go <laughs> And I'm kind of here for it. I mean, look, not everything on this NXT show worked, but there was a lot that did. Um, uh, you know, the 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 mellow story is interesting to me. Uh, yes, uh, I, I I mean the mellow like the the who the who took out Trick Williams story. So long as you're like able to put it out of your brain that every time they do these mystery beat up attack things it never really makes a lot of sense if you actually think about it too hard. Like guy doesn't realize who he's getting the tar beaten out of him from. I uh, can't tell like height, can't tell size. Like, Eliza Dushku. That was the name I was trying to think oh, of. Oh yeah, Eliza Dushku. Yeah. yeah that, that, that's who JC Jane is in this whole thing. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. 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 No, she was bad back in the day. Um, so like, uh these beat up angles right it's like you have carmelo hayes you have braun breaker these three men are not built anything remotely alike i just can't tell the difference between the three of them one of whom is his very good friend and thus dispositively rule out at least one of the three of these people always cracks sort of like tune that stuff out of your mind um I like it. I thought it was a pretty good little angle. Your turn. Um, let's see. Um, I feel like we we've basically hit everything. I mean, Blair Davenport and Gigi Dolan. What that's gonna be? Um, yeah, I know everything on NXT that was worth a damn, other than maybe. <laughs> no, it, it's it's all it's all been hit. It's all been hit. Yeah, Keanu James though, uh, total gamer. Um, we get to Raw. Uh, I liked. I liked opening up Raw with the Judgment Day promo. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a strong, confident, solid booking move. That's just like, it's just always an engaging move. The he, we're going to have a very good night tonight. And like, that makes us as the audience want to see them have a bad night tonight. And like sort of saying we're gonna have a really good night tonight implies, you know, that bad stuff's going to happen to them. It just, it just becomes a good wraparound narrative. And like, and they're a good through line for the entire show too. Like that's, I love that Seth uh, Rhea segment. I thought that was smart as hell. Oh, that was great. Um, that added a lot of layering to Seth's characterization in particular, in particular, the very, very strong want to more like position yourself as the opposite of Roman Reigns. Like that, that I think is a really interesting move from Seth. 
I think the weakness of this though has been shown in the now Nick Aldis and Adam Pierce are competing GM type things. And it looks like, see, I thought originally war games was going to be baby faces versus heels and that judgment day and the bloodline were going to find a coexistence versus all these baby faces who can't coexist. But what it's feeling like it's going to be now is it's going to be a few of these baby faces join up with the judgment day on raw. And then a few of the baby faces join up with the bloodline over on SmackDown and we're getting red shirt versus blue shirt brand supremacy crap. And I think, I think that's the weaker choice. I think the stronger choice is you have the bloodline and the judgment day aligned in terms of interest. And then you have all these baby faces who are bickering with one another and, and, and accusing each other of being turning. And it's like, okay, what's going to happen there. Hmm. You really think that's a stronger angle than who's the better GM, Nick Aldis or Adam <laughs> Pierce? Oh, oh, and now they're they're already snipping at each other because oh, I'm sorry I insulted uh, you uh, on hot, Friday this is night. The hottest angle in wrestling right now. F Jeff. that. Uh yeah, it's like that that's that's a Vince angle, is what that is. That's that's not it's a triple hot H Molly of an angle is what it is. Triple H should be ashamed of himself for that crap. Uh I'm here for Tazawa being part of Alpha Academy. He yes. is so unrepentantly stupid, and I love that guy. I mean, he's such a great wrestler, and they they don't. He he is in the position you think WWE would put him in, but he also just his shelf life is so great because he's so good at the physical comedy and the facial expressions, and being and getting beat up a lot. That that it's it's one of those things. Like I. I, I adore this. I'm happy he has something to do now on the main roster too. I, I was a little worried that, you know, after that Miz program, they'd have nothing for him, but uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of wacky on the, on this raw brand in terms of alpha Academy, new day uh, DIY, you know, that tag team morass in the mid card while there's a unified title is a bit of an issue, but they seem to be doing something with it. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, Alpha Academy, yeah, they're primarily working as, like, comedy right now, but now all of a sudden you have Gable, Tozawa, and Otis as, like, a, as like a trio. That could potentially lead to some fun matches, dude. Like, I, like those, I those howled, guys, you know, all work really well. I held at the backwards caterpillar by Xavier yeah. Woods. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> Woods has that, Woods has that mischievous streak in him anyway, so that's the kind of spot he might do. And also, uh, like how that that backfired on him too, right? He yes, got, yes, yeah. he got. And, and Wade the Barrett, off. Wade yeah. Barrett was really great about that too, where he's like, yeah. well, "That's exactly what he gets for doing a backwards caterpillar." Which, like, yes, in like an actual fight, it's about the dumbest thing you could possibly. Um, I have a general question about dynamite. If you don't mind us porting sure. over there, unless you had anything over there. No, no, uh, I think I think we're I, I think we're good on Raw. I liked the parts of dynamite. I'm just not so sure. I liked the order of the parts and I, I had some arguments on, on the old, on Elon's X thing that, that are very good arguments, but I'm not sure they sell me. So, so allow me this, that first half hour of dynamite, uh, you know, with, with, with all the various moving parts in the MGF angle, I really liked I just thought it should have been the last half hour of the show. And then you end hot as opposed to a, a kind of lukewarm on the heat of the, of the Brian Danielson quote unquote injury by Okada type of thing. Um, Okada not seeming like a big, big enough deal, although the crowd loved, it. but what was put to me was, well, Tony knows that his biggest audience are going to be in that first half hour. So that's where he goes to. And I'm like, why are you looking at your competition and building a show that way instead of just doing the show that you're doing? And I think the other one was, uh, well, yeah, you know, you, you have that and you have the competition and so you put your world champion on there first and the hardcores who are already going to be there staying through the night are going to be there for the Danielson and Okada stuff. 
and I can kind of get behind that. And I there was another point I made. I but that's no that right second now. hour was a really weird way to kind of close out the show. You had like a long Sheeta Ruby Soho match. That yes. Was- longer than the build justified as in there was no build so we don't need a 20 minute there match. was not only no build but that match wasn't a great wrestling match that was a that was a raw style slapstick match it didn't have it and and, and my problem with that match because i watched um i watched the shows on saturday is they built up this thing where Ruby and Jeff Parker had an interaction about how Jeff Parker was going to be, or Angelo Parker was going to be, you know, a trios champion after battle of the belts. And Ruby's like, I want a championship. I want a title. And that turned into, Oh yeah. I take the paint. You grab the paint. I pretend I'm painted. I grab the belt. I block the paint with the belt. I take the, the strap off of my wristband. It was, it was prop comedy in the middle of a quote unquote important championship match for Ruby. And I just, I, I really just did not like that match at all, to be honest with you. And then it set up Tony storm, who is now full on doing Gloria Swanson from sunset Boulevard as Dr. Luther has become her Eric von Stroheim. (laughs) I mean, it's like, and, and, and she will be the one that they need to just put the belt back onto, but and 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 Tony Storm's gimmick is it should not be anywhere near the title. That's the problem. No, you no. Know, here's the funny thing. It, and then when they do that, they put the belt on her, right? Like if they, then now you actually have a perfect character with whom to tell movie stories with. Yeah. And they, and they won't do it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Like like they they will they will completely neglect to do it. Something going on behind you? Um. No. I'm just. Uh. Shadow has finally returned home. Oh yes. We had cats that were fighting before the show, and we want to make sure that the cat, we're not doing Fight Club for cats. Yeah. Chesterfield, get in here. <laughs> uh, any other points on uh, on your scorecard here? I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on AEW. I just, I thought it was kind of a cold. Like, if you're gonna bring Okada on. I don't know what the best usage of him is, but like that it's, Blackpool Combat Club, like tag match wasn't it. You know what? It's not. It's not doing the the best friends and Orange Cassidy and 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 that crew are part of Chaos in New Japan. So we have to continue the Chaos membership with New Japan instead of just bringing in Okada on his own. And being a big deal. No, I'm I'm with you there. I, I, I thought Okada felt small here in terms of presentation. Now the crowd loved it. The crowd was there. Right, right. And, and, and like and having him like especially now that you've turned Blackpool Combat Club every which way but loose at this point. I like Blackpool's the very a very bad pairing, even though there's narrative storyline there, they're a bad pairing for Okada. Um if anything you should have like the dark order goobers out there going like, we'll take on anyone. We want a piece of Kazuchika Okada. And like Okada basically hits the rainmaker on like every member of uh, uh, dynamite. The, the other problem was the story from the Blackpool combat club doesn't make sense in, in this, in this regard we end on and, and Oh, this was, yeah. Somebody else was arguing with me about this, about how I don't like suspense and drama because of the way that this, this, uh, the show ended and I was like, well, you ended with very awkward. Everybody kind of looking at each other and no real tension being built. Okada's trying to get over the he's taunting Brian Danielson, but that was a little bit rough to do that. You didn't have John Moxley just roll up and punch any member of, of, of the best friends that were out there. You just kind of had them all looking at each other because now you've made Blackpool combat club, baby faces when really they've just shown their willingness to just start a fight with anybody. You don't have any pushing and shoving. You don't have a lot of yelling, really. It's just kind of like, and and the crowd's dead. And I think they wrote this expecting the crowd reaction. And I thought they thought the crowd was going to be hyped for a fight. You know, this is awesome. Chanting this, telling them that they're going to fight each other kind of a thing and then hoping that they'd come to blows and then they never came to blows. So it was all just kind of a blue balling of that audience, which was kind of hot for you. 
totally right. Like this was absolutely written for the studio audience to be like, this is awesome. Like if some variation of fight forever, you know, whatever, whatever the chance going to be. Um, and they didn't get it. And again, Blackpool combat club, terrible foil for them at this point because they have been turned so many different times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and one coda on, on NXT, by the way. And that's my last note of the night. Your coda Abushi, you might say, uh, Jade Cargill brought out like the big effing deal that she's going to be. They have hit all the right notes on every show with her. I think now we'll see how she does when she gets into the ring, but in terms of always been the issue, huh? Yeah. But in terms of star presentation, bringing her out and having her sit on a throne right before your women's title match. I mean, they've laid out the red carpet. Let's see if she can walk through. I mean, that that's all you can say, really. Yeah, no, no. She's got the red carpet. Um, she looks like a million dollars, but yes. that's, that's never been the issue. The The issue's always been, okay, like, how long of a match can she actually carry? It's, it's ultimate warrior problems is what it's always yes. been. Yes, yes. And, and I, I assume they will not be debuting her in a 90-10 match. Against Carmen Petrovich. <laughs> no, right. I mean, it, like God. Ariana Grace is getting fed to her. Let's let's face it. That's that's the person to feed to her. First match, the beauty queen, where she just gets her ass beat. That's what I right. Want. No, no, that's a good one because she's also a heel. So there's no chance that like the crowd's gonna rally behind Ariana or whatever. They're gonna yeah, like like. A goofy heel is the perfect sort of uh, unsympathetic person who you kind of want to see, you know, get get it handed to them a little bit. Yeah, like if she, if she gets put up in the main roster sooner than later, Chelsea Green is that first person. Yeah. Because Chelsea yeah. will make her look like a million bucks, and she's a goofy heel who always loses, so that's fine. Uh, I got, you know, go that is somehow a champion. I love it. Yeah. Uh, let's end it there. Uh, you can follow me on X at Crap Game 13. You can follow the show at Shake the Ropes, all one word. We are part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Podcast for all of your various uh, wrestling fandoms. Music of the Mat, Five Star Match Game, Open the Voice Gate, The Good, the Bad, the Hungy, our AEW-centric podcast. And, of course, the flagship with Joe and Rich ranting and raving for three hours. Um, you can, if you like what I do and why wouldn't you, um, except for the one person who said I sound like a jerk all the time, uh, <laughs> you can join fight game media for five bucks a month. I do a show with Paul Fontaine about 20 minutes after AEW ends called of all things, the dynamite show where we thoroughly deconstruct that show to its barest essentials. It's also live on YouTube. If you just want to watch Chris, on the other hand, is only on the Instagram. He might be on threads. I haven't asked him yet, but uh, it's at D-O-C-T-O-R underscore N-O-V. And he does things on the gram. Chris. Yeah, uh, on the gram, I talk about the tram. Uh, but the other thing, I do, <laughs> on the gram, baby. On the gram, I talk about the tram where I'm eating flesh. <laughs> Sam, I am. I, 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 like I will green. not eat green eggs and ham, Sam. I am on the tram. I will not eat them on a tram. I will not eat them on the gram. I will not eat them. Yeah, no, I, I also teach guitar lessons. Uh, you can follow me there. Uh, I'm working on some new songs, so I've been posting those onto Instagram. Uh, if you want guitar lessons, bass lessons, uh, drum lessons, I do those all uh, virtually. Holidays are coming, people. Get that guitar lesson for the person you love or book an hour with old Novi for somebody you don't like. Uh, either way, I still get paid. You can book an hour with me if you like. I'll drink eggnog and talk to your relatives that you don't like. It'll be great. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, you could put me on with anybody. Uh, you know, so, long, <laughs> so long as the money's right, I'm there. It's a Zoom call. How bad can it be? We are whores. Pay us, please. Uh <laughs> yeah, no, um, other than that, yeah, uh, that, that's all I got this week. And uh, possibly special guest next week. We'll see. We shall see. Guy whose favorite wrestler is Jeff Jarrett. Talk to you later. Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling NOAA. Not only do we analyze events, 
but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. Music. It's not just part of our daily lives, it's part of our wrestling fandom as well, and it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in. Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling, hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network.